Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Let's see if this works. All right. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can, no, it's your microphone. No, wait. You turn off. Draw from the call. Don't. Can you hear me now? I cannot hear your microphone. Oh, it's my screen. Wait, I'll screen. Aren't you glad that Zoom meetings are slowly dying down so we can do this in person? Because every Zoom meeting started with that. Can you hear me? Can I hear you? Have you ever had a Zoom meeting that just started? Never. <laughs> so I'm really, really glad that we do this in person so it's not on Zoom, so we don't have to go through the entire thing. And it's my first time on this kind of 360 stage, so I'm sorry if I'm ignoring certain people. I'll try to turn around as I talk like this. So, uh, kudos to the organizers. I want to give them a round of applause that they pulled off this in-person event after so many Zoom conferences and stuff. If we can have a round of applause for them. Because I'm really glad that we're back in person so we can have new fights and new discussions because the entire, you know, Pfizer versus Moderna and Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, like COVID is not even SEMVR compatible. So all the discussions got annoying and we can finally go back to discussing Redux versus Lodash, Angular versus React and whatever we're going to argue about at this conference. Tailwind sucks and I'm really glad that we can do this in person. So before we start the talk, I want you to do me a quick favor. So. Turn to the person to the right or to the left or to the back, whoever you have around you, a cameraman, whoever it is, and just ask them one question. Do you work for Facebook? So I'm going to give you a couple of seconds. Just turn to the person next to you, any side, and just ask them, do you work for Facebook? I'll give you a couple of seconds. If you don't have anyone, you can ask the cameraman. It doesn't matter. And on three, two, one, I want to hear the answer like very, very loud. Three, two, one. Thanks God, because if you said yes, it would have been very awkward. So 99.9% .9 of web developers don't work for Facebook. And the question that I'm trying to answer in this talk is, why the fuck are most developers acting like they do? So we'll move on with the talk. I'm Kitze. Um, you can find more about me on my website, kitze.io. Usually I had a couple of slides telling people about what I do, but now I just describe myself as a rectangle mover. So everyone is like a senior rock star ninja, mecha, Godzilla, King Kong developer. I just describe myself. I take a rectangle, move it three pixels to the right, five pixels to the left. Sometimes I put a Z index, 999, 999, essentially a rectangle mover. Um, the tool that I'm mostly focused on building is called Sizi, and I want to torture myself at every conference just to ask people who's using Sizi. When I see three hands in the air, it, then I think about it for a week. So thank you. <laughs> thank you to the, to the actual users. So we're making this browser for developers for two years, and we definitely need to change the name because it's not a browser anymore. It started as a tool for previewing responsive designs. We can preview multiple devices at once, but eventually during two years, like we worked on it every single week, just releasing new and new and new things which are going to essentially speed up your web development process. I tried to put a couple of slides here, but I, it, I don't have enough time to describe you all of the features that we've put in this tool. So there's plenty of things. One of the most exciting for me is organizing all of the projects that I have on disk so I can quickly open them in my editor or open them in my finder. But as I said, I don't have enough time. There's plenty of features. I would appreciate it if you go and check it out. Back to the talk. The talk might be a bit harsh. Uh, Kent already talked about problem solving. Now I'm going to just dumb it down and just be more aggressive with pro problem solving. So we actually start spending time on the things that matter. So I'm saying it might be harsh because for some of the things that I'm going to discuss in the talk, we're going to agree. You're going to be like, yeah, that's like that. Some of them are discussable and so on. So some of the things that I'm going to talk are going to be like pineapple on pizza. Most people are like, you, what the fuck? But there are a huge amount of people who are like, I love it, right? Some of the things that I'm going to talk about, and let me try this clicker, if it's going to work, it works, are going to be like this. When you look at this, you're going to hear some of the slides, you'll be like, what the fuck is he talking about, right? And some of them are like this. These are not kiwi on pizza, cutting out a hole in them, not even discussable. So this is a fixed truth, and it doesn't change, and that's it. So just to continue whatever Kent was talking about, um, and when I'm, when I'm talking to you here in 360, I also imagine like an invisible tiny kid sitting somewhere because I'm also talking to myself. So I, I also suck at these things and sometimes I need to remind myself that I, I need to do this. So when I say you stop solving non-existent problems, I'm also talking to the tiny kid in the audience to stop solving non-existent problems. I'm going to give you an example. Somebody complained that the landing page for Sizi was getting some memory leak or whatever if you leave it open long enough. So the developer ego in me, the developer in me immediately was like, to the web dev mobile, we need to fix this, right? And then I thought about it, this is my ego talking because somebody said, leave the website open for a long time. So 
as a developer, you're spending so much time building a website, right? When, you, when we build a landing page, we have the marketing team, we have animations, we have, we're writing the copy to be perfect, we have responsive design, we do all sorts of things to craft this perfect website. And how do you browse landing pages and be honest with yourself? Now, right now, when you're gonna go to the CZ website, you're just gonna scroll it, you're gonna be, in three seconds, you're gonna be like, $5, I'm not fucking paying five, and you're gonna close the tab. So that's the reality of people browsing websites. Why would I optimize my website being open for a long time? Nobody opens it for longer than a minute. So look at the analytics. If the analytics say so, then solve the problem, if it's really a problem. I had this in my workshops. I'm doing React workshops, both basic and advanced. And there was always a discussion of inline functions. As soon as I would declare inline function, I wouldn't mention that it's an issue, and somebody would be like, um, you declare that in line and it's gonna be a problem. So I'm gonna introduce a character here. This character is called the Horsey. And like, we've all been him at some point and the internet kind of ruined him. And all the time when someone's talking about something in web development, Horsey is going, uh, we need to do something that's totally not needed to do right now. So when I mention inline functions, Horsey is gonna say, um, aren't they gonna slow the app down? And then I'll be like in my workshop, no, actually, what was the question? They're gonna be redeclared on every render. And I'll be like, yeah, they're gonna be redeclared on every render. And people feel pain when they see this. Like, oh, but the performance, isn't it gonna be, isn't it gonna slow the app down? And the answer is mm, not really. In 99.999% of the cases, you'll be fine. Your app is not gonna be slowed down. And Horsey come with this argument. Uh, but I read this blog post for about someone who benchmarked 90 million lines of code, but you're not Facebook. You read the blog post by someone who works at Facebook or Pinterest or Airbnb and they're optimizing at scale. First thing you do is like, we need to have a meeting. Everyone, get around, we need to optimize our website because inline functions, we need to remove them everywhere. So this happened with hooks, with all sorts of optimizations. People think about optimizations before actually they have the problem. Why? Because we love all of these achievements. We love achieving all of these things that somebody else put them out there as an achievement and we think that we need to do it. So what is the highest achievement for a developer? You would think that it's gonna be solving a problem, making a user happy, making your manager happy, making your boss happy, doing actual meaningful work by the end of the workday. You would think so, but the highest achievement for a developer is one of these. So either chasing this core, that means nothing most of the time, or sadly, this is my screenshot, the second one, and it, it's Kent's fault. Kent, wherever you are, if you're here for some reason, it's your fault. When I released my first open source library ever, every thought leader from Twitter was in my head, so I thought everything that they're doing, I have to do it. So I spent, we were uh, with, my, uh, with, with the company that I worked for, they, they took us to Croatia actually, and instead of enjoying the sea, I was writing tests I was doing full test coverage for a library that has two GitHub stars and seven downloads. But I made sure that I got this achievement, right? I put it on my GitHub and I was like, I have 100% testing coverage when it doesn't mean anything. This is like, we think it means something, but it's mostly like a kindergarten teacher just putting a star on your forehead and it's like, go home now, you achieve things. And these discussions are all over the place, but nobody ever says this. Nobody, had, like, most of the time, it doesn't matter. We think in our heads it matters all the time. And why do I say that it matters? Somebody shared their website, their personal portfolio. They shared it, the Lighthouse course, and they were 100%, 100%, 100%, but PWA was, I don't know if that's a percentage, probably it's false. So PWA wasn't achieved. And everyone in the comments was like, oh, but it's not a PWA, so you didn't complete the, the mission that you were supposed to complete. It's a fucking personal blog. Who is going to install a personal blog as a PWA on their phone to open it? Like, it doesn't make sense. And yet we have these discussions. Is it 99? Is it 100? Is it a PWA when it doesn't matter? When, when Apple released the AirPods Pro website, their performance score was 65. And developers focused on that. Instead of seeing the website for what it was, it was like it had plenty of videos and animations. And it's like some people were questioning, who wrote this code? Like, how did they ever achieve this? This is a beautiful website. And it tells a story. It sells something. And her C people were like, uh, but the performance score is 65 and it's not gonna work on a Lenovo from 2003. Like they're 300 euro headphones. They, Apple analyzed this and they optimized for that. So what I'm saying is we need to look at our analytics every once in a while. I'm super guilty of this, but mostly I don't optimize for anything. But you should definitely look at your analytics every once in a while. Because there are plenty of companies in the world, there are plenty of meetings right now where people are saying something like this. I can guarantee you this is a sentence that's been uttered millions of times in meetings. That people optimize something for some tunnel somewhere. And if you ask them, have you looked at your analytics? And then they look at the analytics 
And it's like, oh, well, these fuckers have Verizon phones on the latest 5G network, or like on the latest iPhone, on the latest Verizon 5G, whatever. They can literally download native apps in three seconds. And we're optimizing that last bit of the bundle, even though it doesn't matter, because we don't listen. Nobody listens anymore. Nobody listens. Managers don't listen. Recruiters don't listen. Users, like everyone is doing whatever the fuck they want to do. Like users are like, this is what we want. And developers are like, but we crafted this nice path so you can walk around. And user is like, no, I just want to do this, right? And users are like, can I get that feature? And developers are like, introducing dark mode. Why? Because somebody on Twitter said that everyone is implementing dark mode, so let's spend time on dark mode. When I say nobody's listening, I actually mean it from any layer in a company, especially recruiters. This is something that happened a couple of days ago. I laughed my ass off. Nobody's listening. They don't even read anymore. Need to get some water. So I have an ideal scenario. What should happen in software development for everyone to be productive, right? This is the ideal scenario. Users need a feature. Managers plan the feature. Developers implement the feature. Repeat. That's the end of the workday. What happens in most software companies everywhere? I'm not going to read this because it's too long, but this is a scenario of what happens in every single company most of the time. Let's see. Every day. This is your daily life, right? I've done this in a company. We rewrote everything in GraphQL just for the sake of it. And now we have an issue. So many developers live on a farm right now, and we need to solve that because everybody quit. It's, it's hilarious. Um, in one of my first jobs, we worked in a very tiny office, a couple of people, and I was eating a sandwich, and I was reading some article about web development. Uh, my boss, back at the day, he worked like, in the same office with us. As I was eating the sandwich, he, he just grabbed my mouse, he scrolled through the article, he was like, what, what are you reading? And he closed the tab. And I got so pissed, like, who does that, right? First of all, who does that, seriously? But and you would be like, well, oh my God, why don't you tell HR? There was no HR. I'm from Macedonia. This was in Macedonia. He was HR, CEO, CFO, CMO, everything. And anyway, I got pretty pissed. Like somebody closes a tab of something that you're reading, but now that I'm older and wiser, I was like, probably he was right. Probably I was reading some bullshit. And he was like, I know better than you. You don't need to read that. So I was thinking about what was I reading that he closed the tab. And I think I probably read some of these articles. And he knew better, and now I know better. And he was right to close the article. I mean, it, if it was this one, it's okay, questionable. But the other ones, I would definitely, I, I would need a person anytime I read something that doesn't benefit me at the moment, I need someone to come and just close the tab. Because we're taking so much pride in our over engineered apps. I think we're more proud of over engineering the app than actually de delivering the solution to the user. And I'm at fault here. Because when I released my first side project, it was called OK. I don't want to trigger your assistance. So I released a list of um, commands for the voice assistant from Google. And instead of, um, instead of tweeting about it, like, hey, I solved this issue. If you don't know what your voice assistant can do, this is what I made. And this is the solution for your problem. I tweeted, hey, I made this website using React, Redux, Reselect, Aphrodite, Material UI, whatever the fuck. I just put a bunch of words there. So I was more proud of what I used than I was proud of what I actually built. So somebody told me in my DMs, like, hey, you might want to change that announcement because people mostly don't care what you use. To... This is like a waiter coming to you at a restaurant, and instead of describing you the meal, they're like, um, we use the Cookmaster 3000 and a silver spoon to like mash the potatoes. And you're like, but I don't care. Describe me. What is this? Is it a fish? Is it... And we, we're definitely guilty of this. I was guilty of this when I was building this product because I used all of these technologies based on hype. So this is, and when it was posted on Hacker News, not by me, I would never do that to myself. Those people, you, you don't want to be roasted there. Somebody posted it on Hacker News. And now when I think about it, people were right. Like, why did you use all of these technologies instead of just using HTML, CSS, and jQuery and calling it a day? But I was proud. And I was like, how dare they? I used Redux for this product. And now I'm thinking about it. Why was I using Redux? I had, I'm not kidding. I had three straight properties. Whether a sidebar is open or closed, and two more things. Then I used Redux form. And you might think, oh, you probably took user submissions for form, and you had some form builder thingy in order to you know, get data from users. I had one search field. And I spent a week on connecting this search field to my Redux store. You know that rabbit hole once you go down in it. And for, for no reason. And then I used reselect, which at this point, I even forgot what it was. But you might think, oh, you, you were fetching data from an API and you needed to normalize it and so on. No, this was a client-side app. My data was in a JSON. I used reselect, and honestly, I just threw it in for good measure. 
I have no fucking idea why you reselect. And this happens all the time. This is a cycle that happens all the time. This is, I'm gonna expose some of you right now because some of you have tweeted this, right? Some of the people here have tweeted something like this. You've made a blog, you're not even planning to write, but you tweeted that you made it with, ooh, all of these shiny and fancy technologies, and now I have a blog, everybody. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna expose at least 35 blogs. I'm gonna put them on display here. There's at least 35 people in the audience who have this blog. Raise your hand if this is your blog, and be honest, otherwise you're liars. There you go. They're the honest people in the back. I respect you. Because I'm seeing so many of these blogs and you enter and it's like an article from 2018 about SVG and they never write again. Instead of just writing on Medium. I was writing on Medium for like five, six years before I actually launched a blog because I wanted to write, not to, to, to make, make a blog. Um, this is me when I think about seven to eight years ago when I was still in college. Me and my roommates won startup weekend in Macedonia, which is a which was a huge deal back in the day. We won with an idea, super revolutionary, a food delivery app. So back then in Macedonia, there was no food delivery. We get it, you had it, you're Croatia, you're one of the best countries in the area. We didn't have a food delivery thing. And of course they gave us the award. Like the judges were like, what the fuck? This country doesn't have this, you win. So we won this, so they gave us an office, they gave us resources, they gave us a team, they gave us books, everything that we needed to launch a startup. But we would be millionaires, being somewhere near the sea. Actually, I am near the sea now, but we would have been at a better place eventually. If only we didn't do this. I swear to God, everything fell apart because people who wanted to invest and people who wanted us to build the thing were like, where are you going to store your motorcycles? Where are you going to, who's going to be your delivery drivers? How do you have an experience running a business? And what we did, we were in a room, me and my roommates, animating the line of the password field of the login form. So when the user types the password, we animate the, the characters or whatever the fuck we were doing just to entertain ourselves. So that was because of our ego. And of course we burned, we never built anything except the login form. So this is, we wanted, we built the login form, we animated a bunch of SVG lines and we quit. So nothing happened out of that. There are food delivery apps in Macedonia right now and I cry every time. Well, it is what it is. So at this point, I hear people are very excited when I talk about this because most of my um, talks have this same message, like ship value to the users, stop wasting time. And I'm afraid that some people are getting the wrong message and you're getting the message that we should never move on and we should never use new technology and we should never change a stack. We should always deliver to the user, which is not always the case. So I, I'm definitely trying to say this, but people here and they're high-fiving themselves in the audience, told you we should never use GraphQL told you we should just code and keep the focus on our users, which is not the truth. So sometimes you need to change your stack in order to be more productive and to deliver more value to the users. So from this point of the talk, we're flipping the script. Um, we're going to talk about stop solving solve problems. And I'm going to give you three examples of solve problems that we're solving in the web industry. And I'm also talking to myself. Problem number one, a fucking button. There is a meeting somewhere right now where three layers of, of the company are discussing how are our buttons going to look like. You can use fucking Material UI or Chakra or Tailwind or 30 billion other solutions because let's define what is a button in, in web development in software. It's a goddamn rectangle that has three states. It's primary, danger, or success. It's green, red, or yellow. And there's so many meetings about a fucking button because people, the ego in us is like, yeah, but our buttons are special. Yeah, but the rounded corners in the chakra library, nah, we're going to make them better. Because we, like, we don't want to solve problems. We want to solve problems all over and all over and all over again. Problem number two is state management. This is huge. My first talk that I ever did was actually focused on how we're solving state management wrong. And I can tell you there's already a solution for state management. Most of the time, mostly, it solves it. You don't want to hear this. Most of the people don't want to hear it. But it's still the solution to the problem. So I have an entire 30-minute talk about this, but the gist of it is, if you have issues with state management, mostly you have issues with data. You're using a REST API, you're fetching a bunch of data from different endpoints, then you use Redux, Normalizer, Reselect, whatever, in order to normalize this data on the client side. If you just switch to GraphQL, 99% of your state management problems would go away because now you're just fetching whatever data you need and you're focusing on a very small part of state management. Of course, people wanna, don't want to hear this. And I'm saying, just move on from Redux already. And somebody's going to be like, um, it's actually 2021. I know. That's my point. I left this slide intentionally just so people think, wait, it's actually 2001. And it is. 
Redux could have been a tech demo at a conference and people could have been like, oh, that's interesting. Let's never waste millions of meeting hours on, on this technology. But no, we love our engineering and we have reasons to use Redux. You might not trust me. You're like, why are you telling me to, what to use and what not to use? Okay, don't trust me. Here's the creator of Redux. This is like a band releasing an album and then issuing a statement, don't listen to our album, it fucking sucks. Like he's trying to convince people, you might not need this, people, and people are like, nah, we actually need it. And he's trying hard. In 2019, he tweeted again. He was like, I'm looking at my old Redux code, I have no fucking idea what's going on there. I think he doesn't swear. But in his heart, he said, I have no fucking idea what's going on there. Because if you've seen a Redux code base, you know what I mean. There's actually two reasons to choose Redux in 2021. I don't want to be too harsh with Redux. So you want to feel smart about pushing a string into an array is reason number one. People gather by the water cooler, right? And everyone's talking about, ooh, our backend layers and the caching and the mechanisms and this. You cannot be sitting there talking about, I moved this div a few pixels. Like, you want to feel smart around them. You're like, oh, yeah, we're using this Redux reselect refunctor pop funko things in order to push a string into an array. But on, like, jokes aside, there's a second reason to use Redux. If you're paid by the hour, you definitely keep using it. I always ask this at a conference, is anyone a MobX user here? Because I've been babbling, just, just one. It's probably the creator of MobX somewhere sitting in a hi-hat with mustache being like, I like my own library. It's sad because Hersey would say here, Mobix is mutable and not pure enough for my standards and that guy from Facebook, but you're not Facebook. Facebook somehow convinced people that whatever they're using at their company, you also have to use the libraries, the standards, whatever they're doing, you also need to do it. Same thing happened with Redux. People are obsessed with pure functional code, but mutable code in most of the cases would have been fine. Somehow we got convinced. Problem number three is styling. So a lot of companies do, like there are solutions to styling. And there's a lot of people who still do this. There's Tailwind, there's plenty of other things around that you can use. And still people are like, nah, not good enough for us. There's actually a very good solution to styling. And a lot of people don't wanna hear it, but it exists. This problem exists, this solution exists. And I've been using it for a really long time and it solves a lot of the problems. This is like, just imagine, if there was a deadly virus in the world, just imagine this, and there was a cure around, why wouldn't people, uh, that's, that's a bad analogy, actually. That's not, not going to work in this scenario. When you read this, what is your reaction? I know it's a pretty horrible thing. Your first reaction is, ew, right? That, that's what I did when I saw styled components. I swear to God, that's the first reaction. It's like, ew, who would do this? It's a string in a JavaScript temp template, literal thingy. Like, I would never write code. The next day, I was writing code like that. Ever since 2016, I've been using it, trusting it that they're going to improve the performance, the runtime, and everything else. And turned out fine for me. Hersey would say, what about runtime performance? And I'm like, what about that? Well, Facebook just made their own CSS in JS Lab, but you're not Facebook at the end of the day. And when Facebook released that solution for their in-house thingy, everyone panicked like, oh, whoa, we might be not using the right thing because they're using that. And then there's the last argument. What about the 14 kilobytes I'm going to add to my bundle? There's this quote from Gandhi. Uh, adding 14 kilobytes to your bundle is better than your team spending months on reinventing styling 19 million times. I had that discussion yesterday with David here, uh, who is working on X state, and they actually had the entire thing from Twitter because Twitter was like, "Oh, this is like 14 kilobytes." When they ran an actual survey, nobody, most of the people didn't care about the actual um, kilobytes, but. There's a loud minority talking about these kilobytes and people are somehow convinced that we need to optimize and super optimize everything. There's developers going around saying, th there's actually a workshop where someone is saying, you're losing millions of dollars. Am I making millions of dollars? Is our startup with 10 people and 15 users losing millions of dollars? I mean, let's be honest, this is my one GitHub sponsor. He's sponsoring me with $1 per month. I just added this slide here to shout them out. You're a, you're a champion, one day I'm gonna buy you a beer with your own money. But, yeah, round of applause for my one GitHub sponsor. You're not going to lose millions of dollars. It's just a hypothetical for the big companies that you don't need to follow. I, I started this thing on Twitch called This Week in Web Dev. People send me links. I react to them. Mostly it's like me face palming for 45 minutes. And the first link that they send is CO2 emissions on the web. And I immediately get triggered. I'm like, oh my God, did you take it that far? Okay, let's read. Let's read. And the article is like, you don't need JavaScript. You don't need a CSS framework. I'm terrible at CSS. I need a CSS framework. If I write vanilla styles, they're gonna be horrible. All of that aside, the last thing says, I constrain myself to one kilobyte of CSS. And I'm like, well, you must be saving the planet, right? I wanna check this person's blog to see if, what else are they doing to save the planet? 
and the polar bear is thanking them for writing a bytecode interpreter in C because they're using all of their time to, to save the planet. And hilariously, the next link was somebody who made a Polaroid camera with CSS gradients only, which means with their CSS, they're killing the polar bears and they're harming the planet. I already asked you if you work for Facebook. I'm not going to torture you to ask you if you work for Airbnb. Probably the answer is no. And yet, most, a lot of developer teams are using this thing. So this is made for hundreds of engineers. You're seven people in an office. You can literally over lunch say, hey, we're going to use semicolons. Yeah, cool. That should have been it. But no, we're using ESLint config Airbnb. If you haven't used this, you're absolutely blessed. And I'm going to explain it to you. If you use this, anytime you miss a semicolon, a SWAT team is going to enter. It's going to be like, use a semicolon there, motherfucker. It's, it's super harsh. And I can go on. I have like four minutes left. And I can go on and on and on with these examples. And I just want to make it clear that I'm not bashing any of these technologies. All of these things, all of these things, all of these discussions exist for a reason. I just think that people are using them without a reason. They're just using them because they read an article. They're optimizing for something fictional that doesn't exist. You might ask, does you sound very preachy today? Like, why the fuck are you concerned, right? Who are you, the mayor of WebDev City? Like, what's your problem? And I actually care, and most of my talks are going to be about this because I'm so passionate talking about this. We need to ship more, and we need to ship faster. And for a brighter web... Wow, that makes me sound like the mayor of, of WebDev City. For a brighter WebDev future. I tweeted this out for people to stop creating CLIs because I think we need to move on to UI and to nicer things. People are obsessed with the terminal. I got crucified on Twitter. I didn't even read the replies. They were cursing my mother, my grandmother. It was horrible. But one reply just stuck with me. There's one reply there that I couldn't stop thinking about for a week. For a week, I was just thinking about this reply. Just picking up my dinner, thinking like, holy shit. Somebody said, well, buddy, UI is temporary. The terminal will be here forever. Ever, ever, ever. So I would just eat dinner and the terminal will be here forever, ever. I'm like, forever? People are like, what's wrong with you? You're staring at a wall today. I'm like, the terminal will be here forever. Terminal will be here forever. So I start, okay, it's going to be here in five years. It's going to be here in seven. It's going to be here in 10. Forever? You're going to open a terminal, navigate to the project. You're going to do that forever. Tesla introduced a freaking humanoid robot. Not introduced, but they're going to do it, right? It's going to lift up things and do errands for us. And I swear to God, if I see this on the street and I see it running Vim, I'm punching it in the face. I don't care if robots have feelings. The terminal won't be around forever. Why? Because most industries are using this tools to create worlds. They're not moving rectangles. We're moving rectangles. Left and right. Oh, the header is 900 pixels. We're moving rectangles. These other industries are creating worlds of 3D, of movies, of CGI, of games, or physics, of AI, of whatever the, the hell. And they all figured out a way to do it with UI, but we cannot do it. We have to use a text editor, right? We cannot. Ours can be automated. Ours cannot be made in a nicer environment. We have to use the terminal and a code editor and maybe a browser for developers if you give it a chance. But my point is, what I started reading, uh, I started following some game developers just to torture myself, seriously. So I was like, I'm going to follow a bunch of accounts just to see what are people doing in the gaming industry. And do you see this? It's made in a UI. It's a freaking river with an island thingy, and you draw it with your mouse, and it has physics and everything. And how can you not be pissed? This is what I was doing all day. All day I was messing with this kind of problems. Move the rectangle above the other rectangle. And I'm like, who's wrong here? Like, what, what, what are we doing? There must be some, some issues here. And you, and you might be like, OK, Kitsa, you're the mayor of WebDev City. Tell us how do we move on. Like, tell us what is the solution. I think the solution is to embrace innovation, not to always accept it, not to always adopt everything that's new. But a lot of times we, we react to innovation like, oh, wow, that's way too new. Like, when they release this, this is style components. You know, you're like, oh, but cars haven't been like this for millions of years. This cannot exist. And there's people who are like, oh, that might be interesting. Cars might be changing. Same with CSS and JS, same with everything else. I see people being too protective of their knowledge. Like, we were, if I spend time learning MobX, I don't want to move on because I spend time learning it. It's like a bunch of candle makers when electricity was released, they were very released, like they released it on GitHub. But when electricity was invented, like a lot of candle makers were pissed because what do I do with my candle making knowledge now? I used to make candles. And other people were like, oh, I can flick a light? Fuck candles. I'm not using that anymore. So we need to move on and stop being protective that much of our knowledge because we can move on and actually enjoy ourselves and use the new technology moving forward. I, I had plenty of slides in my previous talk about how AI is going to replace us, how AI is first going to help us as web developers and then it's going to kick our ass. And this time I decided to do it with only three slides. And I'm almost done with the presentation. This thing exists. 
this thing is real. Yes, I had a talk with someone yesterday sitting here in the front row and he was like, yeah, but it's not that good. It's, it's not even good. We are better as web developers. AI will never replace me. And as soon as I saw this, I let out an evil laugh. And now I practice this evil laugh daily. I brush my teeth and I practice an evil laugh because this is going to replace us. And I can tell you after 10 years, I was fucking right. And if you're still skeptical, oh, humans are better. We're more intelligent. Are we? <laughs> is it not going to replace? Are we that? that? Let's do a quick test for the end. Let's see if AI is not going to replace us, all right? People in the back, people in the middle. Is this a bagel or is it a dog? You're squinting right now. Oh, well, it's one of them is... AI is not going to do that. AI is not going to do that. Another test. Is this a chihuahua or a muffin? If you said, uh, AI is going to replace us. Help us and eventually replace us. Because our developer ego is the worst. We know this. We don't want to admit it because we're very important. Somehow we're rock stars. Sometimes we're all of these things. And we're way too important right now. Like, Yutarni published my web dev diss song. Of course our ego is... is it's crazy, like what is happening? We're just rectangle movers, what is going on? We say things like, I'm a React developer, I'm an Angular developer, everything that we're doing, we put it as our personality, that we're this person, and because of this ego, we're not gonna let any AI or something replace us, right? This is every pull request ever, because of ego. This is every pull request. No, I think you should correct that. No, I should correct this. No, correct that, correct this. I'm gonna mention something, a word here, and I'm almost done, I see my time is up, if I can have one more minute. Um, if I just mention this, there's already whispers in the audience. Isn't this like old technology? If I say this, I'm not going to be able to eat my lunch. You're going to be like, um, actually, um, you're wasting kilobytes because we have fetch and this is like four kilo. And to test this, you don't have to actually prove this to me. I tweeted a slide before the conference and somebody said this in the reply. <laughs> Proves my point. So before we summarize, I would appreciate it if you hang out and if you actually come later just to argue with me about some of the points that I made. I know that I'm not right about everything. You can follow me at DKids at places. You can check out CZ. And now let's summarize. Last slide. We should stop solving non-existent problems, talking to the invisible tiny kids in the audience too. We should stop solving solved problems, stop taking pride in our engineering, let go of our ego. I know this is lame, but still it sounded good in my head. And follow kids on social media. And last but not least, the important message when you're over engineering is you are not Facebook. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. Ladies and, and gentlemen, hands together for Kitsa.